Press the bell icon so that you don't miss any updates from Walkspace. My personal policy for VFC is we do not represent a film unless we feel personally passionate about it. You know, like it doesn't matter, um, you know, if it has big names or if it's this or that, if I don't feel personally, you know, moved or, or excited about it, I can't go pitch it. You know, I, it's just, it's inauthentic. That policy remains regardless of who, who's interested in VFC services. So how are you doing today, Filmi? I'm good, thank you. I'm so sorry for the slight delay. Um, I'm so it's morning time for me, and um, it's it's. I don't know if if this makes sense, but it's garbage day, you know, and people pick up the garbage. <laughs> oh. it's very very loud outside the window, and I didn't want to interrupt the first bit. So I'm like, let me just wait five minutes for the trucks to go by. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's totally fine. That's okay, totally great. Fine. So I was going through your stuff. So you write, you do podcasts, you uh, you uh, do film promotions, screenings and everything, but everything related to cinema, right? So yes. where does uh, the love for film come from? Or maybe talk a little bit of your background and where you come from. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so a funny story that a lot of people don't know is that my name, Delani, apparently my mom got it from a movie. Mm -hmm. So uh, when she was growing up in Sri Lanka, there was a song, I believe it was a Singhali song when she was growing up that sang about a dream girl named Dilhani. So she took out the H and named me Dilani. So it's kind of an ambiguous, a lot of people don't know based on my name, where I'm from um, and things like that. So I always tell her, I'm like, you you destined me for this. Like you named me after a movie girl. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah. really, yeah, I honestly, the love for cinema, it came from my parents to be very mm -hmm. honest. So um, I was born in Canada. They came here from Sri Lanka uh, with my brother in the eighties and I was born here later. And at the time that they came to Canada, there really wasn't a large Tamil population or, or South Asian was kind of just growing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my mom and dad, dad loved films, they loved music. And so the one thing I think my mom really wanted to do was make sure that me, who was born here in this country, still had that connection to our Tamil culture, to our background, and she used movies to do that. Mm -hmm. um, she had a couple of VHSs that she brought with her. <laughs> and uh -huh. then slowly as, you know, movie rental shops started to pop up here in Canada, like that was our weekly outing, you know, go to pick up the latest rental, which might have been latest, meaning like in the last six months <laughs> has arrived here. And I loved it. It was my, it was my favorite pastime with my parents. So I'd go to school here in Canada, you know, and watch American and Canadian TV with my friends and talk about that. But then I'd watch Tamil movies, Hindi movies and everything with my parents and, and immerse myself in that as well. So for me, it was kind of like a, it was just always around me and I loved mm -hmm. it. It was the music, it was the dance, it was the, the color of, you know, all that comes with Indian cinema. And to me, I think that obsession, that kind of relation to it never went away, mm -hmm. even though, you know, as I grew up and in high school and was starting university, as much as I would have loved to go into film, it wasn't a common thing. I knew nobody, you know, especially South Asian around my age who pursued film school. Mm -hmm. Or even just, you know, studying media or arts kind of, it was very rare, much more rare than it is now. So for me, I mean, I, as much as the interest was there, it never struck me as like, this could be a career, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I, I absolutely fantasized about running away and, and being a heroine when I was like <laughs> 15. I was like, how am I going to get from Canada to India <laughs> with no dollars? <laughs> So, you know, like it, it was, it was always there. It never went mm -hmm. away. Um, and then as I was finishing my, my undergraduate degree, which has nothing to do with film, uh, by the way, it's in mm -hmm. genetic biology and mathematics and statistics. Wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's so but, <laughs> yeah. I, ha I think I have to take a movie one day on genetics just to make it all worth it. Um, yeah. <laughs> But, you know, when I was finishing my undergraduate degree, I just was realizing, you know, I excelled in what I studied, but I didn't have an interest to work in a lab or do research or anything like that. And that that passion was still there. 
So as I was finishing my undergraduate degree, um, you know, that, that interest to be involved with film or entertainment, it had not gone away. So mm -hmm. I decided to do my MBA to, to bridge the gap and to mm -hmm. get into the business side of film. And that's mm -hmm. kind of how I, I kind of created this path. And I think in a way I ended up creating jobs for myself <laughs> in this in this world that I live in, where, which is Canada, which is all the way away from where, you know, South Asian films are made, but mm -hmm. deeply connected to them in particular. So, yeah. Sure, because I, uh, as you were explaining, right, like I was observing something that I, I come from a Telugu community. Mm -hmm. Most of my family and my cousins, my friends, right, they watch mm -hmm. a lot more Telugu films than the movies they actually have access to. So there's right. some kind of like a feeling of just connecting to your homeland kind of thing and cinema mm -hmm. kind of allows for that. Yeah. That's really interesting. <laughs> yeah. My mom's, um, you know, to this day, my mom's number one, you know, even my dad knew it was, he was her number one is Kamala Hassan. So uh -huh. I, you know, grew up knowing Kamala Hassan as more like more than I did say like Arnold Schwarzenegger or Tom Cruise uh -huh. or something. I'm like, no, Kamal's the biggest hero though, <laughs> right? Um, but you know what, to me, I, I always loved that hybrid kind of upbringing that I had um, mm -hmm. and my brother is a really big movie buff too but he was never really into the to the Indian movies or Tamil movies so with him I watched you know the Hollywood blockbusters I went to the theaters and watched all the latest Hollywood with him and mm -hmm. then you know it was about going to rent those VHS, which became VCD, which became DVDs going to the store with my parents to get those right okay interesting so let's get to your company, right? Your, your, you find a film consulting. That was one of the most interesting things in your profile. So could you explain to our audience what exactly you guys do at the company? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, years ago, uh, I started it when I was living in India and working in production. Um, mm -hmm. I, so I formally uh, formed the company in 2016. However, I had started doing what I was, what I'm doing through the company. Prior mm -hmm. to that, kind of more on a freelance volunteer basis, sort of. So what VFC mainly does is we help bring um, independent South Asian films to international audiences. Mm -hmm. So I worked at TIFF uh, as I graduated um, out of business school. And when I was at TIFF in several different roles, one of the roles that I loved the most um, was South Asian programming. So I helped to pick South Asian films for mm -hmm. the film festival. So while I was doing that, um, one of the very first films that I helped to choose was uh, Kakamute, which is uh -huh. uh, director M. Mani Kandan's debut film yeah. uh, that was produced by, you know, um, Danush and Vetri Mansur. And it was a really, really wonderful, amazing debut. Mm -hmm. So when Mani Kandan, sir, who is absolutely my mentor and, and to this day remains a really big part of, you know, my career, um, Mani and I came here to Toronto for the first time for, for TIFF. And when he came here and met me, first of all, I think he was really shocked to see there was a Tamil girl <laughs> here working at TIFF that helped to choose his film. Um, mm. he, he just opened up to me and was like, you know, there's so many more filmmakers like me mm -hmm. who could use the help to basically pitch on behalf of, you know, South Indian movies in particular to mm -hmm. these international festivals to help them explain what is the merit of our movies, right? Why should you play it to your international audience? And it really was a gap at the time because most international programmers for festivals, they had a really good knowledge of Bollywood. Like when it came to Indian cinema, it was all about Hindi movies and some, you know, art house, Bengali, Marathi kind of movies. But the South languages were not yet very well represented in mm -hmm. film festivals, aside from Maniratnam, sir. And mm -hmm. even then, Maniratnam films were playing in a retrospective. They weren't playing mm -hmm. as its premiere, right? It was mm -hmm. more like looking back on his older works. Mm -hmm. So when Maniratnam kind of expressed that to me, it started to click. I'm like... Yeah, I guess I could help. Like I could be kind of that person because I'm now a part of the film festival circuit, but I'm also deeply, you know, still my number one passion and fan is for South Indian movies. Mm -hmm. So it just kind of 
planted that seed in my mind. And after he went home from, from the festival, he started connecting me with other directors that he knew who had mm -hmm. um, first time films or, or maybe second, third films uh, that were waiting for an audience. And, and, you know, getting into the theatrical market was still a waiting game, much like it mm -hmm. is now too, right? Yeah. So I started just doing that on the side, kind of just helping filmmakers to revise their edits, create festival cuts, and then helping them pitch to the right festivals. And I was doing the pitching, you know, I was mm -hmm. speaking to the festivals on their behalves to explain to them, why is this movie so different from everything else coming out of Indian cinema right now? Or why is this director somebody you want to watch, right? Um, and it never felt like work. It was never work. Mm -hmm. It was purely, I was doing it in addition to my <laughs> full-time job. It was my passion, my hobby, my interest. And um, and I turned that passion and hobby into a company because after I came to India in 2016 to to work on uh, Manyana's third film, um, Andu and Kattale, which was a fantastic experience, uh, I had filmmakers coming to meet me from other states. You know, I had people coming to meet me from Bangalore, from all over, and in Chennai, and asking me, oh, will you help my film too? Mm -hmm. So Mani and I kind of sat down and he said, you know, I think what you're doing, you need to do it properly or more formally. And so that idea to establish a formal company and kind of offer this representation service as kind of a package came mm -hmm. about. So today, BFC has represented over 45 movies, a lot of national award winners, and we've taken them to, I lost count, but somewhere around 120 or 30 festivals, maybe in total. But um, so festival representation is still our main, you know, bread and butter, but uh, we also helped a lot with connecting subtitlists to, mm -hmm. to new production companies, you know, helping to break those kind of monopolies that are in a lot of South India. And now we've ventured into production. So we've got our first short out that's doing the festival market right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm producing two more at the moment um, through a fund that I created um, in memory of my late father, who was always mm -hmm. extremely supportive of VFC. So Rika, while you're explaining this thing, right, this is a process that uh, most Indian filmmakers, at least indie filmmakers don't know that much about, but it would help them a lot to actually get an audience that uh, the distributors can't get them here. So, mm -hmm. so how do you find these films and how do you get in contact with these filmmakers or if there's something that is not well known, how do you search for them and figure that out? Yeah, it's really, that's a really great question. I feel like my answer is underwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> But my answer is that um, truthfully, I've been really fortunate that my most of my clients have all come to me from word of mouth. So the good thing about, you know, Indian cinema and I think uh, South Indian cinema in particular is a very tight knit community amongst mm -hmm. directors and producers. So when one person's film achieves, you know, everyone reaches out and is like, congrats, like, you know, who did you work with to, to get it to TIFF or to get it to this festival, right? So um, in that way, the directors that I've worked with have been really, really wonderful in referring me over and mm -hmm. over again. And people that I work with usually they're bringing me their next film, their next film, because they still want to, you know, pursue the festival circuit from now on, now that they've got a taste for it, like they really want that, right? So yeah. I truthfully don't do a lot of advertising. I've been really fortunate that it's, and I, I kind of prefer word of mouth, to be honest, because mm -hmm. I know that the director who's coming to me knows what I do. They know my strengths and they're coming to me because they, they've seen my, you know, proven success through someone they know. Right. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to, I don't just sell as much, um, mm -hmm. but I really am very still cautious though. Every client I come into contact with and every film that gets presented to me, it goes through the same, um, what do you call rigorous kind of consideration. Like just mm -hmm. because it's a director I've worked with before doesn't mean I'm going to represent every movie they do. Mm -hmm. uh, my personal policy for VFC is we do not represent a film unless we feel personally passionate about it. You know, like it doesn't mm -hmm. matter, um, you know, if it has big names or if it's this or that, if I don't feel personally, you know, moved or, or excited about it, I can't go pitch it. You know, mm -hmm. I, it's just, it's inauthentic to be honest. Right. And so, um, that policy remains regardless of who, who's interested in VFC services. 
So that that was going to be my next question. So what is the criteria that you go into choosing a film or not choosing a film? Is it just instinctive or there's some kind of like a check mark you have in your head or something? That's a really good <laughs> I I want to say it's almost like 70% instinctive maybe uh-huh. and then 30% kind of like is this new? Is this um a unique story? Is this mm-hmm. speaking to some kind of current fascination that maybe it's going to strike a stronger chord for example like if something is trending in the news and and this film is speaking exactly to that i think it could speak to festivals or be much more interesting for festival programmers right now mm-hmm. um so but a, most of it is instinctive like if i'm watching a screener and i feel like going on my phone Mm-hmm. probably not a great thing you know because <laughs> because if i if i'm doing this i'm watching a film for the intention of considering it and i'm giving it my full dedication and i it doesn't keep me engaged mm-hmm. that's not a great sign because for a festival programmer um they're watching thousands if not you know th- tens of thousands of submissions for every festival right mm-hmm. and it needs to stand out it needs to hold your attention if it doesn't hold mine and this is my job um you know what i mean like that's not yeah. a great thing right yeah yeah so i had a small doubt regarding that also like so the films that go from india right or any of these countries that go to these mm. big film festivals in europe or america somewhere they're mostly these art house cinema kind of thing like they, they, i don't ever see genre cinema like an action film not mass masala type stuff i'm talking genre cinema like a thriller like a action film or that is not something very political or like something not very specific to a certain audience why do you mm. think that is well i think it depends on what festival you're looking at so there's a mm. lot of festivals out there and luckily there are some that are really expanding their type of programming so mm. i know that one of your interviews you guys had before um you know for the man who feels no pain that movie huh. the festival mm. movie Solution, came yeah. to tiff right yeah. came to tiff had a great reception i was there on its opening night at tiff mm. and people loved it it was so entertaining yeah. it was fantastic right i love that film um but it was it was rare i admit yeah. you know that kind of comedy and action together was a rare pick but it was also perfectly suited to the program that Tiff had which was called Midnight Madness. Yeah. So that program was about quirky um action, martial arts, unique um even sci-fi genre films, right? So it depends. If the mm. festival doesn't have um a really diverse audience, they're going to stick to certain tropes for their programming, right? Mm. But in a place like Tiff where you have programs that appeal to different people, like Midnight Madness has a really dedicated particular mm. fan base and they yeah. they buy the package every year even if they don't know what movies are going to be in it they know they want to see the whole program right so so it depends but it's you're absolutely right though the majority of festivals that don't have a very very diverse audience or a lot of different programs to slot them into they will go with more art house um you know critically acclaimed which i think is a a really generic term you can use for a lot of things but but you know those those art house films that you're talking about i get it but i think it's just based on catering to trying to cater to the audience that the festival serves and mm-hmm. so it depends on the prestige and and the how daring a festival can be with this programming yeah. so do you have like a team of people that help you with this thing can you talk about a, a group the group of people that work with you Yeah, so when I first started uh VFC, I had a bigger team to be honest. Um I was still our company was still very kind of split between um well, at the time I started it I was living in India and only on, when I came back home um the next year did I kind of transition to this more international team of me here and you know, we had freelance designers and and our video editors and um subtitlers and everybody based there we still have that network and that team but i i go to them more on a case by case basis so it depends mm-hmm. on the films that i'm representing at the moment as you know the pandemic impacted the film industry probably you know one of the heaviest impacts in the world right mm-hmm. and so naturally a lot of my work for VFC slowed down at the start of pandemic last year to be honest um and it's a very funny separate story that warrants a different telling i was in india 
the day I arrived, the day that the World Health Organization named it a pandemic, I had just mm-hmm. landed in India. Wow. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, hours, <laughs> hours after um, Modi said, no more international visitors, <laughs> I just got in there and, um, and flew out two days later. Mm-hmm. So with a 48 hour trip to India Um, and it was just because we knew that there would be a risk of getting back home into into Canada, you know, the way things were going. But Mm -hmm. I was there to see all these filmmakers, to sign all these films, all these films that were in a last stage of post-production or just about to finish filming. And all of them got stalled, you know, mm-hmm. like it, it was go, it was lining up to be a very busy year for VFC and it ended up being extremely quiet. So it's really scaled down, like in terms of our team size, it is heavily me. Um, I have some support here with my um, submissions coordinator, um, Sabarish, who's, who's wonderful and who helps with a lot of the um, just coordination of our client work. Um, but it's it's scaled down. We used to mm-hmm. be much bigger, and now I, I employ people more on a freelance basis, and it's just kind of for fiscal responsibility sake. <laughs> so that was the next question I wanted to ask, right? Like the film festival circuit has been really affected by the corona thing. Absolutely. So what do you think is the future for uh, film festivals? Like I saw a couple of film festivals which were doing it online. But mm-hmm. they were not getting the same viewership, or a lot of these marquee films were not ready to give it to these film festivals just to put yeah, it online because online. it's so easy to pirate that screen record it. There's like so many other ways you can just do something. So, what do yeah. you think is the future for, for presentation, basically? Yeah. So, I mean, I was happy to see that a lot of the bigger players last year they were able to pivot quickly and do mm-hmm. like a um an online version or if the situation in their area was okay enough it was like a hybrid so I know TIFF did a hybrid last September for example um and it was mostly online but there were some in-person screenings um and the in-person screeners screenings a lot of them were were drive-throughs I'm not sure have you ever have you ever been to a drive-through movie yeah yeah. sorry drive-in movie yeah, so I studied in ASU, Arizona State oh, okay. University. So they had a lot of. Oh, great. Stress. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes when I say drive in, people are like, what is this? <laughs> uh, yeah. So, yeah. so, you know, in our case here in Canada, we, we use that drive in method while the weather was good a lot. So hybrids, I think, are really just a, just hybrids or online are really just until it's okay for us to gather in mass again like that in the theaters. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think that it's the same with the regular, you know, um, theater going experience festival or regular release. I don't think it'll go away because mm-hmm. it is, it's not just a means to an end to release a film. Like it's an experience, you know, a festival is an experience. Like my mm-hmm. favorite way to travel is to go somewhere for a film festival, explore the city and also learn about that city through its programming at the festival mm-hmm. and the people who come to that festival, you know? So I know it's it's a it's a difficult time. It's a uncertain time for, for theaters and for festivals, but I don't think that they're gonna go away. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, what will likely happen is, you know, the smaller outfits, the, the lesser funded ones, the kind of, tinier festivals that popped up here and there like they may not make it unfortunately out of this period but for the bigger players I think it's just a matter of time before we we get back to that that in person Mm -hmm. um it doesn't mean I don't think that digital will ever go away because there are some people that prefer you know digital and and it'll also take them a long time to feel comfortable coming back to the theaters right Mm -hmm. so um I think it's just a matter of time and, and they just have to kind of ride the wave right now. Like, and it's, that's where you get the digital and the hybrids. This is a lot of, th- this is the same thing filmmakers and actors talk about also, you know, like that yeah. they want films to be projected on those screens, but you can't really tell the people to just come there because it's, it's, it's hard. Like they have to make their own decisions and you have yeah. to create the environment for it. Yeah. yeah and it's, it's such a, um, it's such a, a tricky thing right to to advertise a film to put it out there and then but also recognize that people could be risking their lives or yeah. you know the health and well-being of the people they live with like it's such a this whole pandemic it's it's domino effect right everyone's and yeah. everyone's actions impact each other right and and i and we i think we talked so much about this lately in the industry with with things like master for example mm-hmm. like the big tamil movie you know vijay's tamil yeah. movie like 
it's difficult, right? Like, I mean, I would have loved to see Master in the theaters just because, you know, seeing a Vijay movie in theaters is is a, it's an experience, it's a tradition, you know, it is. Uh, but we didn't, we didn't have it play here at all in theaters. We, I, we could only watch it after it was sold to Amazon Prime, right? Like hmm. we didn't have any theaters open here in Ontario or in Canada in the Toronto area. So it wasn't even an option, right? It's not that it was, and I decided not to, wasn't even. Might've been difficult actually, if it was an option. I don't know what I would have thought. <laughs> to be very honest, yeah, yeah, it would have been maybe a little bit of a very like, <laughs> a, a, like a, a crisis of conscience, I guess. <laughs> uncertain kind of thing. So you never know what you do in a situation. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, you were talking about production, right? You were going to production. So mm -hmm. what can I expect more in the future of BFC? Like you're doing a couple yeah. short films and then anything like what else? Yeah, so I think my my goal was always to grow VFC to a production company. So from a marketing and sales kind of company to to producer. So we started slow with um, our first short, um, Tite, or in English called Untouchability. And mm -hmm. it's been great. We've got, you know, five selections so far, a couple more festivals coming up. We are playing at an online festival <laughs> this month, um, you yeah. know, and that's the first time that we're actually getting an on-demand screening because the festivals that chose us before, they're all just delaying and hoping to have an in-person this year, you know, so so we'll see. Um, mm -hmm. I'm excited for us to partake in a, in a digital festival for the first time. I'd like to see how how audiences react and, and, you know, also choose to watch the shorts. Like I, I love watching shorts at a festival, but it is a acquired taste. I think people mm -hmm. sometimes just want to go for the features. Um, so, so it'll be interesting, but yes, we have two other shorts being produced this year. Um, they were this other, uh, the next winners of the script competition that we held again in 2020. Um, mm -hmm. So they are in production. We're really excited to start sharing news about them soon. But um, in the meantime, right now, we're still pretty, pretty busy with the, the cycles or the ISIS travels of, of Thite. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise, production work from me, you can expect, I think um, VSC will be doing more Canadian work soon because oh. um, so I was recently selected as one of 12 candidates from across Canada for this uh, producer training program mm -hmm. uh, that's being hosted by a Screen Institute here in Canada and one of our biggest media companies. So um, me and these other 12, uh, 11 candidates in the group, uh, we are working now towards developing projects for TV. So uh, it will be really interesting. It is my first time, you know, trying to develop something for television. So it is completely a learning process, but I'm really excited about it. But hopefully, you know, VFC will have its, its first Canadian production locked sometime soon as well. So. Awesome. So on, a, on your personal thing, right? Are you interested in like filmmaking, writing or acting maybe in the future at some point? That's interesting. Oh, acting from Flatter. Because <laughs> <laughs> you, you mentioned it. You said that you wanted to go to uh, yeah. China and become a heroine, right? So I thought, you know what? Uh, I think I got my. <laughs> I think I got my fill of it, at least for now, because. <laughs> Um, it's a funny story and a lot of people would, well, so friends know, but most people don't, is that if you ever watch Andwin Kartale, which mm -hmm. is um, director Manikan's third film, um, I had the pleasure of dubbing for okay. um, certain scenes. And yeah. these scenes were the, <laughs> the voice of the announcer at the passport office. <laughs> Oh wow! Okay, they were staring so at you. I have that very American announcement. <laughs> you, you, you do though. I do, right? Yeah, I know. Yeah. I, I mean, I thought it was a joke at first when Maniana asked me to dub for it, but it was super fun going to the studios <laughs> and and doing that. Um, I loved it. I just had to sit there and read like um, uh, what was it, token number five or something like that, over and over. So I mean, I got my little, I got my little acting cameo. <laughs> Um, yeah, I honestly, direction is something I'm still grappling with. I don't know. And I've been asked this so many times by, um, by directors I work with and, and things like that. Part of it interests me, but to be honest, what I, what always kind of, I think appealed to me and my skill set more was a producer. Like I love project managing. I love working with creatives. Like I really, I think that's why I love what I do with VSC so much is I really, really like 
working with creative writers and directors and helping to bring out their talent and get them the right platform, like get mm -hmm. them the attention they deserve. I, I think I do really well at editing scripts, consulting on them. But if you if you put a blank page in front of me and ask me to come up with a script, I'd be like, oh God, like I don't <laughs> know about this. So in that way, I think producer to me, it gives me that it, it plays to my strengths, but it's also my, my extreme interest to be involved in almost every little thing related to a film, but maybe not one whole <laughs> thing. Like, you know what I mean? So it's, it's interesting. I'm still figuring out kind of, even the type of producer I want to be, you know, we have, I know it's different, the systems, the way we talk about them in Indian cinema compared to how we talk about them in North America, executive producer, line producer, they mean different things in, mm -hmm. in the place you're talking about. So even me, I'm trying to figure out what kind of producer I'd excel at being, you know, mm -hmm. so direction, writing, their potentials, but probably not for a long time. I think I'd prefer to be a producer first. And um, acting, I mean, like, that's totally up to all the directors watching this right now. No, <laughs> no. no to be honest, I've, I've, I've actually had films pitched to me before for acting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, my honest reaction to them is always like, I'm really flattered, but I just don't, I don't think that I do justice to these roles that were pitched to me. They were really strongly written women, which was wonderful. I was so happy to see these characters written, but I was like, for me having, I mean, my acting experience is from being in musicals at school. Like when I was 11, you know, like I just didn't feel like I would do justice to them. And I really just wanted to see, see those films made and help them. I, I wanted to like, pitch them to festivals. I wanted to sell them. I wanted to help edit them. But I was like, I don't know if I could be in front of the camera, you know, at that point. Um, I don't know what I would say now, probably just I'm too busy, but, um, but I, you know, I'm absolutely flattered you asked that. <laughs> but I, I love your answer though. So because see, I, we as filmmakers, we meet a lot of people, right? Producers, but they have no knowledge of cinema or love for cinema where they mm. actually want to like nurture an idea to a final product. When there's an actual producer out there in the market who just wants to make a movie rather than just like all the tags and brands that you attach to it. Yeah. That's 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 like very optimistic for a writer mm -hmm. or filmmaker out there to just go and like, you can just submit an idea maybe that can be built into something and the infrastructure mm -hmm. can be brought to you. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's great. <laughs> and uh, okay, can you give us uh, maybe four or five records to our audience from the films you might have distributed or movie, films that you want people to watch, maybe. Oh, recommendations. Not, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, I always, of course, will recommend um, Kagamurte for anybody who hasn't seen it yet. It's Manikandan's mm -hmm. first film mm -hmm. and it's fantastic. It still holds to this day. I don't think you can say it's dated in any way. And I always recommend that strongly. Mm -hmm. um, some of the other films that I've represented that are available on, on Amazon or in Netflix. Um, so Silla Samangal, uh, which is also in English called Sometimes, which is director mm -hmm. Priya Darshan's film. It's a really tight, short drama about um, the patience of waiting. You know, it's a couple of people waiting for test results together in a lab. And it's such a, a niche and simple topic, but everyone's done um, Ashok Selvin, um, uh, Prakash Raj sir, like they're all really strong performers in this really tight film. And I feel like a lot of more people um, should get a chance to watch that. It's, it's on Netflix. Um, Mirka Torichi Male is another great film that we represented that I was really, really proud to be associated with. So in English, it was Western Guts and it is, or Guts, sorry. And it was uh, directed, um, you know, by Lennon Badadiser. And I just, Lennon, sir, is, one of the kindest and most, you know, what's the word, open to feedback, criticism, wanting to constantly improve and just such a collaborative filmmaker. You know, I really just was so happy to work with him. And, you know, that film was Vijay Sethupati's first production. So I was, I was really excited about how much that team trusted me at the time for this film because and we took it to so many places. It did really well. It is all also available um, now on platforms. And I just was so, I think I look back on that experience and I hope for the chance to work with Lennon Sir again, because he was really one of those filmmakers that 
it's just, he was constantly ready and open to teamwork. He never looked at it like I did this movie myself and it was just me, you know what I mean? Like, and I, I love working with people like that. Um, a couple of our films are, are on platforms. If you visit our website at viewfinderfc.com on a listing of our clients, there's links to all the films that are available on platforms as well. So people can check those out. Um, but those are just a couple of recommendations that are that are closer to my heart, I would say. Um, and, you know, Anu and Kachile, I mean, go check it out. My dubbing debut. Like, <laughs> yeah. like, yeah. I will timestamp it here so that yeah. you can get <laughs> Please don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, recommendations from, it's hard for me to recommend just a few from all that I've represented because like I said, we, we've only agreed to represent a film or work on it if I felt personally passionate about it, right? So, mm. so in that way, anything that's listed on our website, you know that like my heart was behind it and I was absolutely in support of it. Otherwise we wouldn't have worked with them. So whatever is available out there, please go watch it. One last thing I wanted to ask is you said that you people could submit scripts to you, right? If you wanted mm-hmm. to develop them. Is there a, a way or like a place where they can send those to so that I can tell my audience if they're interested in something. something. Absolutely. So you can always reach out to um, us via our website. There is a contact form there. Mm -hmm. So you can reach out to us if you have a short, if you have a feature, if you have a script that you'd Mm -hmm. like consulting on. Um, or you're looking for help with festival representation or even sales representation, you know, helping to pitch and things like that, or connect you with technicians or the right people for your projects. That's what we do, you know, so Mm -hmm. reach out to us um, by our form on viewfinderfc.com. In terms of scripts and our competition, so that is something we run annually now. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's called the, I call the fund, um, so my in name, uh, sorry, in honor of my my father's name. So it's the Ayakuti Rabindran Short Film Fund. And so we last ran it in the fall. So we'll probably do it again this fall. Um, whether or not we'll be looking for features this year or for a short, I haven't yet decided, but you can look out for that competition for yeah. sure. Yeah. I love your uh, Marvel poster a lot. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> so I wanted to like, I think I made this joke in Pulshin's thing, so I'm not doing it again. So. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I saw it in your other videos. I'm like, that yeah. is a dope poster. I don't have another thing on this wall over here. Yeah. So it's, yeah, but MCU is definitely, uh, yeah, can take all my money for the rest of my life. I like it. <laughs> I need it. Yeah. Sure. But yeah. Thank you so much for this. It was really great. This was great talking to you. This was really fun. Yeah, no problem. Thank you.